All right, welcome everybody to the second half reading the Akasofu substorm paper. Um, I am going to suggest that we actually refresh by um, reading a section at the end of the paper first. So jumping to that section and then jumping back to the detailed part. Um, because there is a nice sort of summary at the end of the paper. Um, and I'm not sure, is there anybody here who wasn't here for our first half reading? I was not. All right. Well, I think this will be a great way to catch you up, Karina, um, and re remind the rest of us as well. Okay, I have the link, but I just lost the tab. That's fun. Um, okay, so I should probably share my, should I share my screen, Laura? Uh, she said, yeah, that would be great, but she did it muted. <laughs> okay, thank Excellent you. Excellent lip reading, Karina, thank you. I'm going to do that. I have located the screen. Oh my gosh, there's so many screens. Okay. Yeah, and just to remind you all, we can tell how far we got pretty much because we have some nice comments on this PDF. And to make sure I understand, you just, um, I think I'm in the zone where you can just highlight, oh, make a highlight and then add the comment. Um, I have this open as a raw resource as well, Laura, but I think that'll be all right. Okay, so before the acknowledgments at the end of the paper here and before, well, in the discussion, which is the end of the paper, um, I was going to suggest that we read section 3.1 because it actually talks about um, the sequence of auroral displays during the course of a night, which is what most of us, if we're out looking at aurora, um, are going to see. Um, and this is written, well, we'll see if it's written from really a high latitude perspective, but um, that's, a, that's a nice, that'll be a nice summary. And then we'll go back into the specific sections. Um, would anybody like to start and maybe just read this whole section 3.1? I can volunteer. Oh, go ahead. Even better. All right, 3.1, right? Mm -hmm. The sequence of auroral displays during the course of a night. A single observer moves with the earth with an angular speed of 15 degrees per hour under a continuously changing pattern of the aurora. During a fairly disturbed period, there may be four or more substorms in about 12 hours. In each, the whole sequence A to B to C to D to E to F, G to A may be followed while the observer is in darkness. The field of view of a single observer being limited, he can only see a small portion of the aural displays at each stage of the substorm. He cannot discern more than 500 kilometers away. In the early evening sector, substorms manifest themselves by only an intermittent increase of the brightness of arcs or a little development of rays or folds. Hence, arcs with occasional minor activity are the main auroral features in the evening sky. As the night progresses and the observer moves toward, towards the midnight sector, he will see the westward traveling surges, drifting loops, or even broken up bands, depending on his location and the intensity of the substorm. Between two such active periods, an equatorial or an equatorward motion of arcs is seen. If a substorm begins when he is around the midnight meridian or in the early morning sector, he will see its most brilliant phase. Later, he will see most, mostly drifting patches during the substorm. Between two substorms, quiet arcs will be seen. Such a sequence of auroral display as seen from one station during the course of a night has been well studied. It is interesting to note that although the actual pattern of the aurora is continuously changing as seen in figure one. Many of the characteristic features of the substorm are local time dependent. For this reason, the active features of the aurora have often been said to be fixed with respect to the sun. 
All right. So, <laughs> because this is a discussion, it is very, very succinct. Um, and each sentence covers a wide range of the paper and of what you would see pretty much. Um, I wanted to point out a couple of, of words here. So the first sentence when you say a single observer moving with the earth as the earth rotates with respect to the sun during the day, um, the, the speed of 15 degrees per hour, that 15 degrees is longitude. Um, and then when they also talk about sectors, like the evening sector, um, I don't have an exact um, definition of that right here or um, graphic of that, but the sector refers to several hours where you are in the pre-midnight phase. It's probably uh, three or four hours. And then the midnight sector is um, similarly like on both sides of midnight. So they're kind of uh, uh, centered there. So those are a couple things I noticed. Um, Donna, what, what else? Did you have questions or um, did this resonate with, with what you see potentially? Um, I, I hadn't realized um, the, the differences in uh, where you were located um, in accordance with the sun on the opposite side, how the, that the different patterns were, um, is, were something that would happen every time. Um, and one of the questions you asked last time was the, the difference in the, the direction of the, the aurora moving, if it was westward or eastward. And uh, it, it's not mentioned here, I don't think, but, uh, um, that's definitely when you when you've seen a big substorm from start to finish, you can see all of these these different features and how the difference is from the the late evening um, what it looks like with the, the the lower loops and the the real exciting things that happens at three or four in the morning. Um, I it, it's really interesting to to realize that this is something that happens depending on your geographical geographical location compared to where the sun is yeah that's that's totally the main point and the really interesting insight um, and then we're gonna go back and read now about um, all of these uh, phases where they say a to B to C to D and they have more detail in the description than just this summary has. Um, he also mentions that you could see four or more substorms in about 12 hours. And I think um, that's because they each last about three hours. Um, and in theory, they could just, they do just continue. Um, I don't think that's like the maximum, of, well, I think that's, uh, not likely to be what a person on the ground actually sees. Um, maybe you would see one or two substorms on average, but um, probably uh, for the best kind of night, if you were out all night, um, it'd be cool to see um, for you guys to tell us how many substorms you might actually see. Um, any other questions or comments on this section from anybody? Well, I think the last, um, the full moon day, that was the crazy aurora came in, but the full moon was washing most of it. Um, I, I, I believe there were more than two south storms that I noticed within a matter of, I think I was out there for three hours. Okay. And uh, yeah, no, definitely it just went almost blank and then came back up like three times at least with the strong moon. That's all I can say. Yeah, that also brings up another good point, which is the um, the fact that this paper describes like the ideal substorm, and in reality, when you see these substorms, there is a lot of variability. Um, yeah, are the substorms able to overlap one another? No. Okay. 
technically no, um, because they are phases of energy storage and release, and because they are a global phenomena. Um, it isn't, th that is an interesting question though. Um, Can you differentiate, or is the substorm different than the, you know, sometimes the magnetic loop um, sort of short circuits, and then it creates some uh, explosive aura, is that, can you differentiate between those two? Yeah, so um, the substorm does not always go through all of the phases um, because it's driven globally and um, it's driven most strongly by southward solar, um, sorry, southward interplanetary magnetic field, so southward BC. Um, but if that, if it goes north, it might kind of, um, uh, the, the source of that energy will stop and then it might quiet down or it might not fully develop into a breakup. Um, so, but I think as we read, um, the different, uh, more about the different phases here, um, this will become clear. So let's go back to like page 276 and um, and yeah, who would like to read probably this whole section on A, the quiet phase. I guess I can go ahead. Is it okay? Or anybody else? Thank you. Thanks. Okay, and that is page 276. All right. All right, the quiet phase, t equal to zero, when auroras in the polar region are free from activity for about three hours. Most of these around midnight in auroral zone become quiet and homogeneous particles. Some of them may be barely visible. They are approximately parallel to the geomagnetic latitude circles, circles there. One most characteristic feature of auroral cap bands is that they do not lie along the geomagnetic latitude circles. Even quite close to the auroral zone on the poleward side, arcs or bands do not lie along the GM. GM latitude circles in the twilight hours. Bands closer to the GM pole around GM latitude 80 degree and beyond tend to lie along sun earth line. Further, the location of an instantaneous auroral distribution can differ greatly from the statistical auroral zone. If, however, the auroral zone is free from a significant substorm for about half a day or more, the situation may become may be quite different. At such times, the oral cap may be occupied by fairly active bands, whereas only faint arcs lie in the oral zone. Typical examples of this are the display on 23rd and 28th of December 1957. On those days, the maximum KP was only one plus. The minimum GM latitude at which white arcs finally settle after their slow equatorial equatorward motion during the second recovery phase of a substorm depends on the intensity of the ring current. When this is moderate, as example, when D S, uh, I guess D standard H is of order negative 30 um, gamma, the latitude is likely to be between 60 and 65 degree. Between two oral and DP substorms, during a great magnetic storm, white arcs may descend to GM latitude as low as 50 degree. Typical examples are the arcs that seen in the North American continent during the storms of 13th of September, 1957 and 11th February, 1958. Is that the, oh, I can't hear you, Elizabeth. 
All right, so there's a lot here about the quiet phase. Um, the quiet phase is not really so exciting, but the first paragraph is kind of the main part of it, um, actually. And the first paragraph is, is just the briefest. Um, but basically the point of that is that there's quiet, what we call homogenous arcs, some of which um, are almost subvisual, uh, and that they're parallel to the geomagnetic latitude circles there, which means east to west. Um, so then the next paragraph uh, is talking about what we call the polar cap, so really high latitudes around the geomagnetic pole, pretty much. Um, whoops, trying to type at the same time. I talk is not a good idea. Um, and so around the poles, it's interesting, he's pointing out that these arcs can be basically north-south. Um, that's where he says they tend to lie along the sun-earth line, um, which is is very interesting. If we had more observers way up north, um, it would be really cool to have them, uh, you know, talk about that. Um, let's see. And then the third paragraph, he gets into more details. Um, that at times, in this case, um, there is some terminology in this paper that is kind of um, out of date, but when he's saying a rural cap, we mainly call that the polar cap now, which is a little bit clearer term. Um, but he's saying that there can be activity in the polar cap um, during substorms. Um, and then he shifts towards the region we're most interested in, more of the equatorial boundary um, in the fourth paragraph. And he says the minimum geomagnetic latitude at which these arcs um, can be visible after they slowly drift equatorward um, depends on what's happening further out in the magnetosphere and um, the intensity of a region called the ring current. Um, and then he gives some details on where the boundaries there. Um, one thing to point out the term gamma here, um, currently we call this, um, I mean, it's the same as, as nanoteslas um, of magnetic field. So um, yeah, but, but the basic point, is that those quiet arcs um, are going to, their minimum geomagnetic latitude can be 60 to 65 degrees um, geomagnetic. And then that can be visible further south as well. So um, that's, that's why you all can see it from places like Plumas. Um, yeah, and I see Jeremy's question about during the second recovery phase of a substorm, um, I'm not entirely sure what he means by that. It's not very specific, um, but I think it might be, it might become clearer as we, as we keep going. Um, it's just a phrase though here that wasn't well defined. Um, any other questions or comments about this part? I think it just says how KP is not really a deciding factor of how the overall display happens. Is that uh, due to KP is most of an average over the world, right? So you might see something, but KP still be like really low. Is that how that works out? Yeah, this is sort of a passing reference to KP here. Um, and he is using it as a uh, telling you that um, during the quiet phase of a substorm, um, yeah, it's kind of a, it's a passing reference to a date that you might want to look at the data for. Um, and of course, we're not, you know, this is written for other scientists at the time, so there might be other data that they would want to look at. Um, but yeah, KP is, 
is because it's a global parameter, it does not uh, track the um, substorm phases um, very well. Okay. Qu other questions about this part? This one is a little hard to read, but but this is where I would point it to the, the, the key parts. Okay, so the quiet phase, basically the main point, the arcs are pretty homogeneous, and now we're gonna get into more of the um, key parts of the figure, sorry, key parts of the paper and what happens during a substorm. Um, we should actually look at figure two because he does draw a figure that is really actually very helpful. Um, so some of you might want to be looking at the figure along with this while someone's reading um, as we go on here. Um, so you can see in figure two, these quiet arcs are stretching and the latitude that they're, the minimum latitude they reach in the midnight region at the bottom of the image. And then the polar cap auroras are kind of north-south at very high geomagnetic latitudes. Um, and just to remind people, uh, if you want to learn more about like kind of the orientation of the geomagnetic latitudes and um, where the aurora is, that was covered in like our first article that we read. Um, and you can watch that and read along with that. Um, and then these figures that, um, that are visible, the sun is at the top, midnight is at the bottom, um, dusk is on the left-hand side, and morning is on the right-hand side, um, and the circles are um, areas of, uh, uh, um, sorry, 10 degree marks of geomagnetic latitude. Um, any other questions about this? Anything that I have said or this article thus far? Hey, this is Jeremy. I just had a quick question about the slow equatorward motion during the recovery phase. Is the equatorward motion part of the quiet phase or part of a recovery phase from the previous substorm? Yeah, so as you say it, that kind of makes more sense to me so I can actually d answer that now. It's because um, it's it's a cycle. So we're in the first phase of that cycle which um, when we get all the way to the end, the last phase, the recovery phase, things start to get back to this quiet phase. So it's, it's because um, uh, you know you actually don't just go from A to B to C to D to G, then you go all the way back to A. That's what it means. Does that make sense? It does, yes, thank you. Okay, and there's also, you asked a question about what is DP, um, which I also do not recall exactly what that um, is referring to right here, but I would suggest we skip it for the moment and we might remember or not. Um, would somebody else like to read the next section about the expansion phase? Um, I think I'm trying to look. There's a lot that happens in the expansion phase. So maybe um, yeah. So probably somebody can read section B and C, and then we'll go and break a lot of this down or go into more detail. Um, uh, Karina, would you like to read this part, possibly? Um, I would love to. Awesome, thanks. Um, so am I just reading paragraph B for now, or do you want me to read B and C? I think B and C. Okay. So let's see. So I don't actually have this pulled up, so I'm just reading it off of the screen from the shared page. <laughs> so uh, the expansive phase, stage one, um, T equals zero, is that to about five minutes? Yep. Okay. 
um, or figure three, um, the first indication is a sudden brightening within a few minutes of one of the quiet arcs a few thousand kilometers in length approximately centered at the midnight meridian. Other arcs may retain faint and diffuse until the brightened arc starts to move poleward. In some cases, a barely visible arc may abruptly become bright as if a new arc is suddenly formed in the midnight sky. The brightening is usually accompanied by the development of a distinct ray structure. The expansive phase stage two, which is T equals five to about 10 minutes or figure four. Uh, if the substorm is very weak, the brightening and some development of irregular folds are the only consequences. In most cases, the brightening of an arc is followed by its rapid poleward motion. This results in a bulge around the midnight sector. When the substorm is weak, the poleward motion lasts only for a few minutes and other arcs may not be seriously affected. Such a substorm results in the pseudo breakup. This is often the case when one of the arcs other than the southernmost one is activated. If, however, the southern, southernmost arc is the first to become active, the poleward motion is usually most violent, resulting in a great bulge rapidly expanding poleward, westward, and eastward. In general, the bulge, even when the substorm is only of poleward, sorry, it was only of medium intensity, covers an area large compared with the field of view of a single station. Do you want me to keep reading? Yeah, you're doing great. <laughs> okay. The speed of the poleward motion depends on the intensity of the substorm. It is usually of order 20 to 100 kilometers per minute. However, in some cases, <laughs> be as fast as 200 kilometers per minute or even more. The center of the bulge in most cases is near the midnight meridian. In some cases, however, it can be shifted plus or minus an hour to either side of the midnight meridian. From a station located in the evening sector, the expanding bulge is seen as a motion of bright bands from the eastern sky. If the original location of the activated arc is equatored I said that right, right? <laughs> Equatorid of a station, the bulge is seen as a rapid motion of bright bands from the southeastern sky in the northern hemisphere. If a station is located just to the north of the overall zone, the dot dot dot, <laughs> original location of the activated art is likely to be south of the station. Therefore, at such a station like Barrow, Alaska, a rapid motion of bright bands from the southern southeastern sky is the evening in the evening is almost a daily event. Shall I keep reading? Yep, we'll finish this one off. Oh, look, I see the D. <laughs> so in the morning sector, the expansion occurs simultaneously over a greater range of longitude than on the evening side. Therefore, the folds or the loop seen in the evening sky can seldom be seen in the morning sky. Although the expansion is often seen as a rapid motion of a bright band from the southwestern sky. Arcs or bands laying near the evening and morning twilight sectors are still unaffected at the stage of the substorm. Faint arcs in the polar cap beyond set GM latitude 80 degrees. Um, is that geomagnetic latitude? Yep. Okay, geomagnetic latitude 80 degrees tend to disappear. An excellent example of this type of display was observed on the 13th of December in 1958. This negative correlation between the polar cap auroras and negative activities has been studied by Feldstein and Davis. Awesome, great job. Okay, there is a lot that we covered here. Um, where are, oh, okay, here's the awesome cartoons about this. So starting with figure three, um, the main point here, which is really cool for us, 
is that, um, and this actually corresponds to the stage one of this expansion phase. Um, this is when this all starts to kick off and it starts to kick off with the equator most arc. And so that's something that um, often from like lower latitudes where most of you guys are, I think you can see that equator most arc, equator word most arc, um, but it, maybe it's a little, you can also see the other arcs that are further north. And so I'm not sure how, uh, whether it's difficult or like they might all blend together in your field of view. Um, but if you were a little further north, say like Yellowknife or somewhere like that, you really can start to see multiple quiet arcs and they start to drift equatorward. And then you really want to keep your eye on the um, most further south one, assuming we're in the northern hemisphere, uh, to have some motion. Um, and that's when all this stuff is going to kick off. And that's like really important to, um, well, it's important both scientifically, like how does this kick off? Um, this is called the onset or the breakup. Um, and it's also important to aurora chasers because that's when you see the most beautiful visible aurora. Um, so I'm going to ask a newbie question for anyone sure. watching who is unfamiliar with this. Um, when we're talking about these quiet arcs, are they um, sort of at the same altitude parallel to each other in like a line or are they at different altitudes? Are they stacked on top of each other? Are they kind of arrayed in 3D or is it really a kind of plane that they're um, in? So going back to figure two, um, figure two doesn't show altitude, it shows that these arcs, um, the sort of like pencil lines that you can see, are arranged by latitude. So what that means is that they start to cover the sky as like, here's one to the south, here's one overhead, here's one a little bit to the north. Um, and they, because they're all, arcs are all driven by the same processes, um, and they're fairly homogenous, they're all literally at the same altitude, but then to an observer on the ground, your perspective changes. Um, does anybody wanna add what they see, um, you know, a better description of these multiple kind of quiet arcs like laid out across the sky um, from your perspectives? I don't know I, if it's a proper analogy, but I was thinking if you had a cake pop and you poured frosting over it, it's kind of like when it billows over it, you can see it pushing, you know, and the furthest one down might get the most of it. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good analogy. I didn't follow that, but um, yeah. We're clearly going to have to do some baking later. <laughs> when I see it break up into different bands, I can see them at different heights in the sky and a lot of times the the brighter bands will show up lower than the 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 faint diffuse type of arc that that starts the bright bands will show up lower but um but you do see the the different bands showing up at different heights according to my perspective yeah yeah okay good um so when you say height I think what you mean is relative height in the sky. Um, yes. Yeah. yeah. According to my perspective, uh, yeah. I can see them. In, obviously, they're at the same altitude as what it's describing here. But uh, I do, I do see them um, separated. Yep. Yep. And also from your perspective, say you're looking at these arcs and it's, it's the quiet time and then something's starting to happen. What you see from, say, Plumas, Manitoba, I imagine, is that they start out on the northern horizon. And then what happens as you're progressing through these pictures, as they are moving equatorward, um, they're actually coming up kind of higher in the sky. And yeah. that's because these arcs are moving toward you 
And from the perspective of these cartoon pictures, they are, um, they're moving equatorward. So there's a lot of different things going on um, that, um, yeah, that uh, putting this picture together, um, I think that you can correspond this to what you see, Donna, um, but it might be, if you haven't seen a lot of Aurora, um, it, it might be harder to imagine how this happens, but it gives you starting sort of the, um, the global description and then you can kind of, um, you may or may not be able to recognize that better the next time it happens. Um, and when it, yep, go ahead. When it is, when it's getting closer to me, moving farther south, getting closer to me and say 70 degrees up, up uh, from the horizon, then what I see is a diffuse band. Uh, I, I see the diffuse aurora, aurora and it's, it appears to be ahead of everything else. Yeah, that's also a really good comment. Um, and this paper doesn't talk thus far, has not talked a lot more about um, the diffuse stuff, which is kind of happening even further south than these cartoons, even further at lower latitudes. Um, and the reason, there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is because um, most of these stations that had all sky cameras way back in the late 50s during the International Geophysical Year, most of this was looking at how does the main exciting action happen, meaning the discrete arcs and what happens poleward of it. Um, so there was a lot of focus on that. Um, and the diffuse stuff that we can now see, um, I feel like it really was barely visible. It's now like our cameras can pick it up a lot better. And that's why we're starting to have more discoveries about what's happening even further south of these pictures, um, like Steve um, and other diffuse, meaning more equator word than the arcs in this picture. Um, but yeah, I, I imagine that you you can actually see, and Donna, you can you can feel free to add your little uh, add to the cartoons here. That would be cool um, because um, there is likely a characteristic pattern of what's happening with the diffuse stuff during different substorms as well. But that is like not the main point of this paper and not covered too much. Um, so I'd like to go on to like talking about figure four. Um, and before I do that, I wanted to mention that the text, actually I wanna make two comments. Um, one is a request, possibly Laura, if you could add some comments on what I'm saying to the document as I'm talking, that would be really, really helpful. Sure. Um, and because I'm not able to talk and click the comment and do the thing at the same time. But um, so back up here in the text, I will show you where it is. Um, they start talking about if the substorm is very weak. And so that's actually a really important point is that substorms vary in magnitude, um, again, depending on the solar wind driving. Um, and a really weak one is not gonna have as much activity as a stronger one. Um, and so he goes through and describes what happens with a really weak one. Um, this term of a pseudo breakup is you can find papers about that. Um, that basically means that there's some of this activity, but not as much as the full breakup. Um, okay, so, and I mean, there's a ton more research on like all of these aspects. So, you know, we don't, I don't think really need to go into the, all the details, but just do know that there are, you know, further definitions of what's a pseudo breakup and what, you know, people have studied this for a long time. So um, it's not, 
in the context that we're talking about this paper, we're not going to go into that level of detail, but basically this section of this paper is talking about um, what happens during a small breakup or a pseudo breakup, um, basically just a weak substorm. So um, then it talks about like a bigger substorm, which is really better driving, um, stronger driving, uh, we can talk later about how, you know, solar wind parameters that correspond to this um, and what happens. But um, here in figure four is where we start to see what really happens when this starts to kick off. Um, so the breakup is notably on the equator word side of the auroral oval and then you get this big bulge that moves to the north and to the west and to the east. So basically the bulge kind of expands. Um, it is often called a westward traveling surge or bulge um, because it's it has more motion um, west as well. Um, yeah, so I'm trying to think, um, oh, okay, so the next figure in terms of like 10 to 30 minutes after that onset, that, that actually identifies where the westward traveling surge is more strongly than this figure does. Um, so I may have gotten ahead of myself, but yeah, does, Anybody want to add more description or question about like figure four or this first kind of expansion phase of the substorm? Sorry, second expansion phase of the substorm. <laughs> uh, the, the storm that we saw a year ago on August 5th, um, this, this part seemed to last a very long time. And uh, I think the, the visual part that you see that you we call the omega bands that seemed to go on for for a very very long time uh with those those bands um forming that omega shape and moving uh eastward yeah very cool um, I'm wondering if this paper actually talks about that. I don't think that it does, but um, Omega, uh, maybe I can draw on here, but probably not. Um, so the, the Omega, like a capital Greek letter Omega, um, kind of looks like the outline of, of this, um, this sort of thing in the expansion phase. And sometimes that is more pronounced than others. Um, it doesn't, it's not always forming and recognizable in a really clear kind of way. Um, and there are, uh, again, like certain solar wind conditions that might be more favorable to setting that up than others. Um, but yeah, that is a feature of this same phase of the substorm, I believe. Um, Oh, they are here. The Omega Bands are here. All right, cool. Um, and I'm going to correct myself because I think I slightly misidentified the Omega Bands. Um, so if we, if we go to figure five now, uh, this is 10 to 30 minutes after that expansion phase. Um, oh, okay, so wait a minute. We haven't read section D yet. Is that correct? Possibly we haven't read section D. Okay. All I right. I guess I was jumping ahead. Sorry. No, I, I was you're fine. In you're that fine. We'll read it and then we'll discuss it. Okay. Uh, anybody have other questions or comments on this um, first, the, what we just read before we, before we move on? All right. We're, we're moving along. We're still in the experience expansion phase. It's very exciting and lots of pieces, so that's great. Um, who would like to read section D? 
Maybe and just Jim. a time checklist. We have a little over 10 minutes. Yeah. I think we are going to have to have another meeting on the recovery phase, but that's okay because the expansion phase is pretty cool. Um, there's a lot of different aurora happening in that first 30 minutes, really. Um, uh, Jeremy, could you possibly read section D? Sure thing. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. All right, section D is the expansive phase, not the expansion phase, I guess. Uh, I didn't realize there was a difference. Stage three, from time is equal to 10 to 30 minutes in figure five, at this stage of substorm, uh, the front of the expansive bulge around the midnight meridian reaches its northernmost point. The highest geomagnetic latitude attained by active bands depends on the intensity of the substorm. When this is weak, the bands go up between GM latitude 70 and 75, or even lower. For a medium substorm, it is around 75 degrees, but the substorm is extremely intense and the bands can go as high as GM latitude 80 degrees or even beyond. Within the bulge, the bands are extremely active. As mentioned already, the region beyond the auroral zone around the midnight sector is characterized by the absence of aurora during the quiet phase. Particularly in the midnight zone between 75 and 80 degrees, auroras rarely appear even during fairly disturbed periods. Few of the expanding arcs reach that far. Uh, thus, the occurrence frequency of the aurora in this region has a distinct minimum around midnight. In this region, the daily variance of occurrence frequency of overhead auroras has a distinct double peak in the early evening and late morning. The former corresponds either to active bands moving poleward during the substorm or to faint arcs and patches present during quiet periods. The morning peak is due mostly to faint arcs and patches during quiet periods. In the evening sky, following the formation of the bulge, the folds are formed. The folds move rapidly westward because of the expansion of the bulge. In all sky films, the folds are seen first as a mass of light at the eastern end of the arc. In about five or 10 minutes, they pass the zenith along the arc, then disappear over the western horizon. These propagating folds are called westward traveling surge. If a substorm is very weak, it generates only wavy motions of an arc, and there is little displacement of the arc after the surge passes on. The pseudo breakup is usually associated with a surge which is propagated along a brightened arc without affecting others. During an intense substorm, most of the arcs lying near the midnight sector are much folded seriously, <laughs> are folded much more seriously, and the surge speed is rapid. The bands along which the surges move are greatly displaced poleward after the passage of the surges. The speed of the surges very, depends greatly on the intensity of the substorm. It is of order 10 to 100 kilometers per minute, or 0.17 to 1.7 kilometers per second. Because westward surges are the western edge of the expanding bulge, they're associated with the breakup to the east. It is very common to observe surges traveling westward across the Siberian sky, i.e. Wrangell Island at uh, geomagnetic latitude 64.7, longitude 133.8 west, about 10 to 20 minutes after the expansive phase is seen in Alaska, which is at 66.7 north, 102.9 west. Similarly, the expansive phase in Canada, like Uranium City at 66.7, longitude 55.6, is seen as a westward surge in the Alaskan sky about 10 to 30 minutes later. Most of the arcs lying in the early evening sector become bright and develop the ray structure and folds at this stage of the substorm, particularly an arc along which the westward surges are propagated may become extremely bright. It often shows a slight equator equatorward motion a few minutes before the surge appears in the eastern horizon. Such active features seen in the evening sky are not independent of active displays at other places, they're closely related to rural activity to the east. Uh, the range of longitude in which surges and active bands are seen as another index of the intensity of the substorm. When this is extremely intense, 
westward traveling surges can be seen in the evening and twilight sky. Such an event occurs, however, only during an intense magnetic storm. Uh, one of the most important features of the substorm at this stage is the appearance of westward drift motions of active or broken up bands in the evening sky and eastward drift motions in the morning sky. This type of drift motion may appear in the second stage of expansive phase, but in stage three, it becomes more significant. Well-defined bands, so-called omega bands, drift rapidly eastward. Another interesting feature of the substorm at this stage is the breakup process of arcs near the dawn meridian. After becoming brighter for a few minutes and showing a slight equ equatorward shift, arcs then break up without violent motions. The resulting patches are isolated and cloud-like, resembling a group of cumulus clouds. They drift away towards the twilight meridian. It is common to observe such a phenomena in the Canadian sky corresponding to active displays in the Alaskan sky. To the south of the bulge, patches appear at this stage three. They drift rapidly westward or eastward, depending on the local time. In the evening sector, it is mostly westward, sometimes eastward. In the morning side, it is always eastward. That's section D. All right. Do you want to react to that for a sec? Do you have any thoughts, questions? There's a ton there, and I'd love to see some kind of computer-generated graphic of this that went along with the description to really visualize it a bit better. So I think a data visualization, if this paper was written today uh, as a YouTube video or something, might be really helpful. Um, and, and you certainly have to read it carefully to, to unpack all the motions that are being described one at a time. It, it seems to me that the overall description is that of almost an explosion uh, from a central radius around the midnight uh, meridian that uh, there's motion to the west as the westward traveling surge. And there's also motion to the east, which is a different kind of pattern, which is that breakup pattern of sort of uh, a more ragged pattern, I guess. Uh, one thing I did notice was that a mention of, of uh, that cumulus-like pattern to the south of the bulge also, which may be something like what Donna was mentioning that you see in Manitoba, though I'm not sure. Uh, those were my impressions, but overall I'd, I'd wanna draw this almost as like an illustration to truly understand it. Yeah, and um, yeah, that's a great idea. Am I still muted? Hey, you know, my, my thoughts on this, uh, mm -hmm. You know, this this was really, you know, this this paper historically is like Galileo. You know, it was the first time that somebody said, wait a minute, you know, the aurora is a heliocentric phenomenon. It's not just some random thing that diff happens in different parts on Earth. And the way they were able to, he was able to figure that out was by, you know, looking at data taken simultaneously from all around the polar region. Um, and that, that's why this paper is important. But what's disappointing me about it is that uh, he keeps switching between an Eulerian and a Lagrangian perspective on it. That is the perspective of uh, what does it look like if you're standing kind of on the sun in a stationary way and the earth is rotating around underneath you versus what does it look like if you're an ant on the earth? Uh, which is a lot more confusing. And, and, you know, you think back to Galileo's time, you know, people are describing planets of motions with these, you know, retrograde loops and trying to, you know, come up with these elaborate theories about how that happened. Whereas Galileo said, well, look, if you zoom out and look at it from the sun's point of view, planets just go in ovals. Uh, and so I think that uh, the author here has figured out that you should look at it from the sun point of view, uh, like Galileo, but then he's not actually write, writing it from that point of view in the paper. He's writing it from the observational point of view, thus I think making it a lot more confusing than it needs to be. Hmm, that's an interesting point. That's an interesting point. Um, and, and, for, and for example, whether these bands move east or west depends entirely on the difference between the speed of the aurora changing and the speed of the rotation of the Earth. Um, I I disagree with that slightly. Um, 
but you're right that um, that it is confusing because of that. And that's where I would suggest um, that the figures can really help us. And so um, two things. So one, uh, Jeremy, I think that the um, idea of more of a visualization of, um, you know, at this time, this is uh, as cutting edge as we could get of, you know, having figures in a paper and having nicely drawn like cartoons of this. Um, but uh, we don't have, this points to something that we still don't have, which is proper high resolution global imaging of the Aurora. So there are definitely um, people proposing to do that now. Uh, there was global imaging by satellites with, uh, when I say proper, I mean you have to have the orbit such that a satellite can see the whole pole, um, which, which means like more than just the ISS or a low Earth orbiting satellite. Uh, because a low Earth orbiting satellite can see like a swath of this activity, but not all of it. Um, so if you have a satellite that's more um, elliptical in orbit and covers the poles, you can see all of this. The problem is the last satellites that did that for the Aurora, um, uh, there were some in the 80s and there were some in the late 90s and early 2000s. And they didn't really have the resolution to see all of this fine level of detail that we can see from the ground. And so the fine level of detail is also really important. Um, and then the second point I wanted to say is that the motions that are highlighted in these figures, specifically the westward and the eastward motions, those are, um, and again, there's a lot more research on that, but that's not just um, from one person on the ground, you can still see westward motion or eastward motion and that is set up by, um, there's a lot of different drifts and velocities um, in terms of speeds. So we could go into a lot more detail on different speeds, but, um, but you can still see this from the ground. And particularly the point that's important for us is how this relates to the bigger picture. And so um, what they're trying to show is that if you are a person and it's right at midnight, magnetic midnight, um, you will see uh, a little bit of eastward drift and a little bit of westward drift. A little bit later in the night, you're gonna see more eastward drift. Um, and I wanna correct myself in the definition of the omega bands. I think here they're clearly more of a later in the night phenomena that drifts eastward um, and so uh, it'd be interesting to see if that is consistent with what you saw, Donna, or sometimes we use these terms and they don't match as well. To, you know, there's a lot of people, there's terms and there's the level of precision of the definition. So um, that's why it's, it's cool to go back to this paper and um, kind of try and pick up on the precise definitions, but there's a lot more to it than that, of course. Yeah, I just um, want to jump in really quickly. Um, it is one o'clock, um, yeah. and I just want to time check with everybody. Is everybody okay to hang out for a few more minutes? Sure. Great, wonderful. Liz, um, Gunjan actually posted a really fantastic image of uh, the Omega Band Aurora seen from the ground, the same night that Donna was talking about in the chat, uh, if you want to bring that up. Um, it's uh, called 679-47592. I'm struggling with my Zoom windows. Let me see if I can find that. What do I, do? I have like the Zoom window minimized. I, I believe I was confusing the folds with the Omega Bands. I know I have captured both uh, on the camera, but uh, I think what I was talking about was actually the folds. They appeared to be eastward moving to me. So I was assuming they were mega bands, but uh, when I stop and think about it, the, visually it, it uh, an omega band and the folds are completely different. 
but also not all that differently, you know, um, you know, it's, it's cool to like folds can look like omegas, right? So it's hard to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and then it's a question of, I think omega bands as this precise definition are, are a more rare thing. And so then this is cool. It might give you something that you might actually see or later in the night, some other night you might, um, recognize, um, I don't know if you want to take the ball for a second, Laura, and show yeah. that, um, cause I am just, I think I can. There's also like capital omega and small omega, but that one I think it's a good one of a small omega, <laughs> you know. But yeah, yeah, I have also seen the capital omega. I have examples. I have to go look for it. But <laughs> there we go. And that's also something that, um, thank you, that sure. we, uh, yeah, that, that scientists, if we find true omega band examples, um, I know some people who've written <laughs> papers who are really on specializing on why these omega bands happen and what they might correspond to further out in space. And so if we find um, nights where there were real, um, real omega bands, um, they might be of particular interest to scientists. So that's another cool example with citizen science. Um, but yeah, I think there is um, that's something we can maybe have for like a future ambassador call or a different call, um, a discussion of what is an Omega band, um, and have some people like both from the science side and, um, potential examples from the ground. Cause I think that you're, it, it's not something I'm super familiar with, but I think you're right. They can very much look like folds. Um, and, uh, and this so, is what I was talking about in this, in Gajen's uh, picture. This is what I was talking about. So maybe, a, yeah, so I, yeah, I would like to learn a little bit more about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so possibly we can wrap up the paper uh, and talk about the recovery phase. Um, let's see. Um, and... Where am I? I'm trying to go back, trying to share my screen. Um, okay, let me see how much more of the paper we have. We're in the expansion phase. There is a ton that happens in the expansion phase. Um, and yeah, it's, that's the most exciting part. The most, it's very difficult actually from the ground to and from these kind of cartoons to tell the difference just because it gets so dynamic. Um, and this paper is like, here's one snapshot of all the different kinds of types of dynamic aurora happening during the expansion phase. Um, and then particularly, um, yeah, so then, and you know, the key point is to recognize, you know, uh, the pattern, the global pattern, and then how it, how it quiets back down. So then we can read about the recovery phase. Um, uh, um, Elizabeth, I'm not sure if that's, uh, we haven't met yet. Would you like to read um, section 2.3? Okay. The recovery-free phase time uh, 30 minutes to an hour. As soon as the northernmost active band attains its highest latitude, it may start to return southward. However, <clears throat> it stays to its northernmost point for as long as 10 to 30 minutes, then starts to return. The size of the bulge is thus reduced. The speed of the return motion is usually less than that of the poleward motion, but sometimes it is as great as 50 kilometers per minute. The speed of westward surges is also reduced during this stage. Westward surges may degenerate directly into small-scale irregular folds if their intensity is weak. However, irregularly shaped westward surges often become well-defined loops in a few minutes. A kind of bifurcation seems to take place during the loop formation, often resulting in a group of loops. Group of loops. <laughs> Uh, the location of a loop formation is also an important indicator of the intensity of the substorm. If this is weak, loops can be formed in a few, a few minutes after the beginning in a region close to the midnight meridian. If the substorm is intense, loops form after the westward surges have traveled a substantial distance 
one to two megameters in the middle of the evening sector. The average drift speed of the loops is 30 kilometers per minute or 500 meters per second. A group of loops may be fairly stable and can drift a great distance as much as two megameters with little deformation. <laughs> During uh, 14th February 1958 display, a set of loops drifted from central Canada Central Canada to Eastern Siberia, about 4,000 kilometers. The brightness of the arcs lying in the evening twilight sector is reduced at this stage. Folds in the ray structure may disappear. In the morning sector to the south of the aurora zone, most of the arc or band structure disappears and patches spread over a wide area. They drift <coughs> eastward about 20 kilometers per minute, 300 meters per second. In the morning sky, it's common to observe groups of patches drifting to, to the zenith from the western horizon and disappear, disappearing over the eastern horizon. This does not often occur to the north of the aurora zone. Bands formed, band forms are maintained without disruption. All right. Um, yeah, do you want to keep going? Uh, where was there? Where the recovery phase stage two, one to two hours. The equatorial motion of the arcs continues over a wide range of latitude and longitude. New arcs form in the auroral cap and also in the patches and join in the equator, equator word motion, equator word motion. Many of them become barely visible, however, during the motion. Sometimes groups of patches seem to converge to form homogeneous arcs. The drifting loops often become irregular bands at this stage. This irregularity is reduced in from 20, 10 to 20 minutes, leaving quiet arcs. Arcs that brighten during the expansive phase in the far western sector become faint, and some become barely visible. In the morning sector, drifting patches may be seen at this stage to the south of the aurora zone. To the north of the aurora zone, faint arcs or patches reappear. The recovery stage, stage three, two to three hours. This stage is also characterized by slow equatorward motion of arcs. No eastward or westward motion of the aurora is seen. The brightness of arcs may be considerably reduced. During a fairly distributed period, the stage may not be seen at all. Fairly disturbed period. Yeah, what that means is like the next substorm might just start happening. Um, it might not happen much at all. So this is um, the recovery phase, which takes, takes longer time to recover. So it's important to note, as we know, that the exciting part of the aurora is a little bit shorter than you know, the phase of recovery. Um, and this also gives us another candidate for what those things we are calling omega bands possibly are in that in this um, terminology, in this paper, which again is not the end all be all of the terminology, but, but it's important. Word choice is also always really important in science. And so here um, he's calling them loops. Um, and so it's possible that that's kind of what was shown in your figure, uh, sorry, in your photo, Gunjan. Um, we would have to really check when, um, when your photo was relative to the substorm onset, uh, which can be determined. Um, it's not easy to determine, but that can also be determined by um, other measurements on the ground, particularly magnetic magnetometer measurements. Um, and then the definition here, I'm going to have to actually look at the figure because I'm a little, um, the loops I'm not sure the orientation of the loops and also the orientation of your photo as far as where north is and all of that. Um, but that's another something, something else to keep in mind and um, uh, good to um, think about as well that um, if you are on the uh, westward side of the substorm here and it's starting to recover, what you might be seeing relative to your perspective are some of those loops. Um, so those are a lot bigger. Um, I think the distinctive characteristic of those omega bands um, 
and this is something I'll go back and confirm with the modern literature, but is that they are on this eastward side and drifting eastward. Um, so another key feature of the recovery phase, phase sorry, are these drifting patches. Um, the drift is pretty slow. Um, they mainly drift very slightly to the east. They can also pulsate on and off. Um, I'm not sure 100% the reason they didn't talk about the pulsations in this paper as much. Um, it's possible that, again, the, at the time, the films that they had, the cameras they had, they weren't, they weren't taking video. And so they weren't showing um, how these patches evolve, but, and they evolve in very complicated ways. Um, so there can be all types of different kinds of what's called pulsating aurora. Um, and that is characteristic to the recovery phase and to the morning kind of sector. So if you're out way in the night um, towards the morning, you may see these very faint patches. Um, some people, they're, they're definitely not as brilliant as the main display. Um, and so you may actually go in and miss those, <laughs> um, but they're, they are kind of cool in their own right. Um, and one other plug I wanted to make here is you can see through this paper, um, the different uh, types of Aurora are important. And that's one of the reasons why um, on the Aurorasaurus site, when we ask you to report the type of Aurora, um, we could have chosen, you know, 10 different terms that are in this paper, but they are all very hard to define and, and, you know, it's, as we are talking here, um, it really, uh, it, there's a lot that we're not sure. Is it a loop or a fold or an omega band, all of that. Um, so we went for the simple definition of um, separating these terms. Um, so we went for arcs, which are discrete arcs. Um, and then we ask about the level of activity and the speed of the activity. Um, that's another way to separate what's happening here. Um, and we also ask for, as another type of activity, um, uh, patches, because patches are, they're actually driven by different physics. There's um, electromagnetic waves out in the magnetosphere that cause these um, patches to turn on and off. Um, so it's important to, we made kind of more simple definitions, not definitions, but uh, asks in our questions to um, help characterize the aurora that people are seeing um, in a way that corresponds to this bigger picture also. Um, okay, so figure seven as well shows kind of the last um, phase of the recovery where these arcs are again more uniform in the midnight sector, more um, maybe starting to drift equator word again, um, but then uh, on the pre-midnight um, side, you can still have like the remnants of that activity uh, furthest to the west. Um, and the reason for that, there's a lot of reasons for that, but there's a lot of things happening in space um, that correspond to the aurora being kind of the TV screen of all of that. Um, and that westward traveling surge, how those arcs break up and then move westward, this degeneration of the loops is like the end result of that, the further, furthest to the west. Um, and so that's important scientifically as well to the size of the substorm and what's happening further out in space. Um, okay, what questions do you guys have about recovery phase here? All right. Um, any more questions about the paper or comments? I believe we have written, I mean, we've read almost all of the paper. 
Um, there is one other section on magnetic disturbances, which is it's a whole other topic of um, reading the magnetometer data along with what you see on the ground. Um, so I think that's something that we can as well delve into separately. Um, and I would say if you're really interested in that, you can definitely read that and we can talk more about it. But um, otherwise, I think we have um, really had a good discussion of what people see. Um, yeah, I, don't, I definitely am curious um, uh, for those of you who view a lot of Aurora, um, what you think of the recovery phase description and how that resonates with what you see. Um, I mean, basically in the recovery phase, uh, in, the, in the expansion phase, you should be seeing activity kind of coming higher in the sky for you, moving east and west, um, folds, more active kind of things happening. And then, you know, it's, it's gonna retreat back to the north. Um, but you may be noticing more more than I have. Uh, Jeremy just posted a really beautiful picture and is asking if it's in drifting patches on the morning sector. Uh, that's in the chat. Okay. Um, we would have to know what time it was where you were as well. Um, no, you can also see really clearly here how um, knowing the time and the location is critically important. He says 3 a.m. local. Yeah, so um, I can't quite get back to there again, Laura. Do you That's mind? okay, I'll get it. Yeah. A lot of times the intense, uh, when you have intense aurora, you see these patches and blobs um, happening during the expansion phase as well. What I've seen is when it, it gets to recovery and it, the pulsating patches have more color in them. Mm. Than, than just green. In in this photo, it they look green, and it, it could be the pulsating. But what I've seen is the the pulsating patches have a little bit more color in them, and they're very faint. Oh, that's really interesting. Also, um, yeah, this is cool, Jeremy. Um, so, but do we know what? Um, which direction are we looking here? Are we looking to the west, Jeremy? Northwest. Yeah, so um, it, it's important to note, uh, if we go back to the figure, there are also a few patches on the equatorward side during the expansion phase as well. Um, I am tempted to say because the aurora looks so bright here that this also might end because we're looking to the northwest as opposed to um, seeing the morning side, which is the eastward side. I'm tempted to say this might be more of a um, earlier in the relative substorm um, timing as well. But uh, but you know. It's hard to say all of that from just one figure, one photo, sorry. Um, one thing to say uh, with respect to what you said, um, Donna, is that, um, yeah, I'm actually really interested in what you mean by more color, whether you mean other colors than green or uh, exactly what you mean. Um, I worked on pulsating aurora. Uh, that was the first kind of aurora that I worked on. Um, so I have read uh, and studied a lot about pulsating aurora, but it was like a long time ago. So um, I can go back into that. But I, I don't recall a lot of um, mention of a color change in pulsating aurora. So that's kind of interesting to me because um, it might be again something that like wasn't mentioned all that much 25 years ago when um, the cameras that were studying pulsating aurora were just coming online and the big deal is getting the time lapse and getting being able to see the motion um, so there could be something interesting there uh, there's also about 
10 different types of pulsating aurora that all like blend together and aren't always well separated yeah um all right and it would be in your camera settings as well as as what you would capture and uh if you have a higher iso then you're going to capture more of those colors and uh mm -hmm. not necessarily um you know you may just capture the green depending on your setting as well yeah yeah definitely i think that really kind of drives home the point that that how important citizen science photos are and how important it is not to just submit the ones that that are the most um artistic but to submit several of them because we can see different things in each of them even if they're not necessarily the one you want to post on instagram as your like one photo from the night so please keep submitting we really appreciate that yeah this is cool and um hopefully this uh gives gives you and others more background on um, the substorm. And there's a lot more to it, but you know, this is like a good basic, not basic, but you know, the starting point, the classic paper. Um, and I'm excited that we can all um, continue on from here discussing different aspects of it. Um, Cause there's, there's a lot more, um, to it as well. So, and, and I also learn a lot from um, reading this and hearing about your observations as well. So, um, I appreciated all of your, your, um, all of the depth of your understanding so you can describe this, this paper to us. And I have learned a lot about what I'm actually seeing out there. And you know a lot about what you're seeing out there. So, that's really cool to be able to connect um, those aspects. So, Great, I'm, I'm glad. Um, we do this periodically. We'll probably, um, you know, we'll probably take a bit of a break on these meetings and then, you know, think about other classic papers and topics. So if you have ideas for that, um, let us know. Um, yeah, but I'm sure that we've gotten good notes here and helping um, mark up the paper really helps because there's, it's hard to discern what are the key points of the paper, but really what are the key points vary by people. And so, you know, any kind of um, points you can pick up um, are good and good to kind of confirm, like, did I read that right? And that sort of thing. So, um, okay, so uh, I guess we will wrap up here. Um, I'm going to give Laura a chance to uh, add anything more, uh, but also I want to mention, I believe um, it's Akasofu's 90th birthday pretty soon, so we wish him a very happy 90th birthday as well, um, and thank him for this classic paper that we are still enjoying, so that's pretty cool. I want to echo my thanks to everyone for being here. Again, um, if you're watching this on YouTube, please feel free to join us for other ones. We'll be posting them on social media. Um, follow our blog and our Twitter and Facebook to learn more. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. Thanks. Thanks. Nice to talk to you all. Bye-bye.